Though with many people, the news that Underwood had been left out cast a chill over the sea. There was little to choose between the three opening West Indian batsmen. Although the fact of Camarche playing this time probably made for a quieter beginning. In the two hours before lunch, Fredericks and Camarche made 86. Fredericks was the more strokeful, and although Camarche was once lucky with a miss hook, the fast bowlers offered too much short stuff on so blameless a pitch. Marsh's solidarity confronted England well into the afternoon until Sharp caught him at slip off an attempted foot. Just as Butcher looked like settling, he steered one off the splice, the backward short leg. Superfluous to stress the importance of Sobers as he made his loping way to the crease. He began quietly and with precision. He had begun to look like his old self when he and Davis got into a muddle over a leg bar. Davis started, then said no, leaving Sober's strength as Boycott ran it and broke the wicket. The ball was new, and Lloyd's responsibility was heavy now indeed, but he rose to it and lasted to the close. Slowly but inexorably, blocks of flats are hemming Lords in. The latest masterpiece had all day given workmen a grandstand view at the expense of their employers. The third day, being a Saturday, meant that they were not on parade to see Lloyd fall early to the besetting West Indian stroke, the hook. Davis played the anchor part, found occasional chances to keep his score easing forward, gently. Not unnaturally, he had his sights set on a maiden test hundred. And in just under six hours, he made it. The tempo of the West Indian batting here at Lord's was a great disappointment, and their running between wickets after the scare of Sobers' run out was dilatory in the extreme. Actually, West Indies scored 41 per 100 balls, as against England's 34 per 100 in their first innings at Old Trafford. 